I'm turning now to the book of Joshua, chapter 2 and verse 1. Joshua chapter 2 verse 1, the sixth book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Joshua 2 verse 1, and Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And our subject this evening is faith's higher reasoning. Faith does not reason quite as we would generally reason in the world, but it has a higher level of reasoning. And this comes out so clearly in this passage. We're going back a long way to 1400 BC. The children of Israel have come out of Egypt and they've spent nearly 40 years in the wilderness and now they're coming into their promised land. And Joshua begins to take them in. Moses, now his leadership has come to a close and Joshua has taken his place. And they come to this place called Shittim, which means uh, acacia wood. And uh, they lodged there and spent just a little while there. And then we read of how two men are sent to spy secretly. It's an interesting feature in this account because we're going to be focusing on a woman named Rahab and how she thought and how she came to faith, how she came from paganism, from polytheism, to belief in the one true God and to a dramatic change of life, to a discovery of God and a walking with him in a personal way. We're going to look at that passage, that journey, that pilgrimage of hers. But at first, you read of how Joshua instructed, briefed two spies to go and spy out Jericho. Jericho would resist the children of Israel. And God had said that Jericho, which would oppose them, would be delivered into their hands. But why send two spies? Joshua, at this point, was operating entirely under the command of God. He was following instructions precisely. So why did God want spies to be sent? After all, he knows everything. He knew exactly what he would do. He knew precisely what would take place. And, well, it could be, of course, that God was uh, instructing and training Joshua that he would not always be able to depend upon so much guidance directly given to him, but he would have to act prudently. But really the most obvious reason why the spies were sent, commanded by God to be sent, was because God already knew that he had called to himself and he had opened the mind and opened the heart of Rahab. And he was going to save her and her family from the destruction of Jericho. And God sent the spies not so much to spy out the land, though that was the purpose, but much more so that there would be this arrangement with Rahab for their, that family's deliverance. And there would be an agreed sign and there would be a compact that would bring about her deliverance. It's, it's, a, it's just an insight into the way in which God works. If you're in this church tonight and you've never been in a church like this before, well, it may be that God has himself engineered your being here and overruled so that you hear the gospel. And perhaps through hearing the gospel, <clears throat> God will work in your heart and open your heart to him and to hear this word and you'll come under a profound conviction of need, your need of his forgiving love and you'll long for him and reach out to him and it would all be under the overruling 
of the Lord. Because you know you'll never seek him for yourself. And if God has determined to forgive you and to save you, he will take an amazing initiative so that you hear the gospel, so that your heart is opened. And the spies were sent for no practical purpose at all because God knew exactly what he would do. But for the sake of that interaction with Rahab so that her deliverance could come about. Well, I'm going to proceed with this fairly speedily because there's so much to interest us here. They went and they came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Well, she was a prostitute and an hostess. She ran, in all probability, a kind of boarding house, a lodging place. Many people will say, well, she had been a prostitute, but the Lord had already worked in her heart and stirred her conscience and brought her to a profound distaste and unease with her whole lifestyle. And there's just a glimmer of evidence for that in the passage, which I'll point out to you in due course. But they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Well, that's the beginning. And in the second verse, you read about the failure of their mission, at least in its early stages. They were totally unsuccessful as spies. Their entry had been noticed, however cleverly they dressed themselves to pass as Canaanites. Maybe they were valiant men. They were young men, the passage tells us a little later on. Maybe they didn't look so much like Israelites as many others. They would have been selected with a view to passing muster and getting away with this. But they were seen from the very beginning. And the passage tells us this. Their entry was seen. Their nationality was immediately detected. Their purpose was discerned straight away. They were unsuccessful in hiding that. And it was noted, they were tracked. It was noted precisely where they went. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee. So they'd failed at every point. And they were doomed, the two young spies. And they knew that they'd gone to the lodging house of Rahab. Perhaps they knew somehow about her in advance. Who knows? And they went to such a place, and somebody is would have been said about her years ago, someone of ill repute, because they considered it would be a good place for concealment. And, uh, but no, they were known about from the beginning. But matters get really interesting when you read verse four. And the woman took the two men and hid them. This is a very mysterious act. And said thus, there, when, when people knocked on her door, when the arrest squad came, she said, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. I didn't know where they were from. And it came to pass, she says, she lies for them, to cover them. It's quite an elaborate lie. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. I don't know where they went, she says. Pursue them, look for them as quickly as you can for you'll surely catch them, take them, wherever they are. So she covers for them. And the great question is, why? Why does she risk, risk her life? Why does she do this? Why ever would she act in this way? She might think that they were very likely to be caught. There was very high level of vigilance evidently in the city. There was great fear of the Israelites in the vicinity. Then if they were caught, they would be tortured. It wouldn't uh, 
mean anything to them to give away the person who had hidden them. And then she would perish. The spies may be found on her premises. The search may be very thorough. She was putting herself in grave danger. Well, why would she do that? Whatever had entered into her. She had quite a comfortable time as people in Jericho went. Why, from her point of view, it was a secure city. It is said, but I don't know how this is definitely established, but it is said that historically Jericho is the oldest, or was the oldest walled city in the world. In the ancient world, it was famous for its security and its wall. People in Jericho felt secure. They felt safe. Of course, the land all about was very fertile and it was farmed. They did very well in Jericho and they could flee into the city, which was large enough to accommodate all the roundabout farmers and so on. And they were comfortable. And this Rahab, she had her own place, her own house, pretty solid house was one of the houses that was built into the wall with windows, evidently, one, two, three, I don't know how many, facing at high level the outside of the wall. So she had quite a good place. She was very comfortable. She would have had her clients and now she had something else going for her, the drying of flax for the making of cotton, why, that was quite an industry because, you know, Jericho really was under the uh, uh, superintendency of Egypt. All those city-states in that region had been taken by Egypt. So they were part of the Egyptian empire, if you like. And the, the fact that this is real history, well, you can go and confirm it for yourself in the British Museum where there were all those famous Amarna letters. Many, most in the museum, others in other museums overseas, great national collections, and they were letters written by the kings of these city-states to Pharaoh in Egypt just at this very time when Joshua was entering the land appealing for defense, for Egypt to defend them and help them, or as they plead, all the lands of the king will be plundered by these people who are known as the Apparu, which we believe is a contraction of Hebrews, something along those lines. So there's confirmation of history, of the unrest in the period, the many city-states, some of them walled, Jericho believed to be the oldest of the walled cities. Oh, why? In such comfort and security, and prosperity and ease, would Rahab risk her neck for the spies of a potential enemy? That's the question. And it's answered in the passage because she reasoned and she thought and there were various things that struck her. But I just look at the passage for the moment and here in uh, verse 6 we read that she'd brought them up the two spies, to the roof of the house, the flat roof, and hid them with the stalks of flax. They'd be some three feet long, many of them, and they would be, uh, well, conveyed down to Egypt for the great cotton industry. And she'd laid them in order upon the roof. And she had so much of this material there that she could hide those two men. And so the arrest party, we read, pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And uh, Rahab went up to the roof and she spoke to the men and everything becomes clear why she took the great risk. And she said unto the men in verse 9, I know, I know, before I read on, she was profoundly convinced of something. And this had made her act as she did. This is insight. I know she was certain of it. 
It was proof to her of certain things. I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us. She knew that God had said to Moses and to Joshua that the land would be theirs, the Israelites, that the level of wickedness and evil among the Canaanites was so great that God would clear them out before them. And this would be the promised land. Well, I'm not going to discuss that in particular, but the fact that Rahab heard this, knew this, it was evidently well known, but she believed it. So she could say, I know that God is going to do this. Just a minute, Rahab. What about your gods? You had many gods in Jericho. Why the Israelites only had one God, they believed in one true God who created all things. And you've got lots of them and lots of idols and you've probably got many in your house. So what are you saying? And what do you mean that you know that the Lord has given you the land? Ah, oh, well, you see, she'd come to realize that their gods were no good, that their gods were self-invented that their gods were not personal, you couldn't know them, you couldn't prove their power, that their gods were just idols representing fictitious gods. She'd come to see that and realize that. She'd come to see that those idols just accepted different sacrifices and acts of worship, but you just hoped superstitiously that they were actually giving you good fortune. You had no proof of it. But the God of Israel was different. Look what he'd done. Astounding things, unmistakable things. He brought those Israelites through the Red Sea. He had provided them with manna and water and they'd lived and very well in a desert place for 40 years. These things were astonishing. These things were known in the pagan nations. This God was a God who did mighty, unmistakable things. And so she's able to say, I know that the Lord hath given you the land because he does what he says. And if he has stated through the late Moses that this is what is going to happen, I believe it will happen. I believe he is the one true and living God. And once she'd got that, this was the way he reasoned. He, she reasoned, he is the one we must serve. He is the one to whom we must pray. He is the one who will help us and forgive us and bless us in life. That's the reasoning of faith. He was certain. And so she says, your terror is fallen upon us. We in this city, the Jerichoites, for all our boasted strengths, we know that this is going to happen. Our morale has collapsed and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. And then she rehearses some of the things that she's known. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Well, that's 40 years ago but it's still in her mind and her memory. And what she did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom he utterly destroyed, antagonists and opponents of Israel, and God gave the Israelites victory. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God... He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And she'd come to believe in the one true God. So she didn't count her prosperous, secure city as secure at all. Her present life she saw as valueless and doomed for all the outward seeming benefits. And this is the reasoning of faith. And then she looked at her own city and she saw it with new eyes. 
and she saw the emptiness of its religion, which I mentioned, but she saw also how shallow and corrupt society in general was, and she saw all the exploitation, and she saw the immorality, and she saw the viciousness, and the fertility gods, and the child sacrifice, and immensely cruel things going on, and horrible things, and all the superstition, and the lawlessness, and the slavery. And then she heard of the Israelites. Well, they were not saints, but oh, they had a much better society because they had the law of God. What is this law? Ah, it would be said, the law of Israel says, here are the Ten Commandments. That's beautiful, she said. Those commandments are so beautiful and so protective and so wonderful. All the regulations of Israel demand that people are treated well and properly and kindly. Kindness is everything. A law to protect society and to protect all the people in it. And she began to see the superiority of the kingdom of God. And then she heard other things. She heard about the preaching of Moses. I'm sure they did. And how Moses had said to the people, See, I speak for God, and he send, sets before you life, meaning eternal life. Why, the Bible is quite clear on this, that Moses preached about eternal life. We read the clearest the comment on that in the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 11, illuminating what Moses and others meant, what Abraham believed, how they looked for a city which is to come, praying that God would bless them in this life, but more importantly, he would give them eternal life and life hereafter. Oh, she said, to have eternal life, to have the forgiveness of the one true God, to have union with him, to walk with him, to be taught by him and blessed and helped by him, to live with him for all eternity. Why, the reasoning of faith saw Jericho on the one hand with its lawlessness and its cruelty and then its prosperity and its war was nothing. And on the other hand, it saw to honour and obey the one true God and have his forgiveness and happiness in your heart and purity and everlasting life and faith reasons, Lord, forgive me. Bring me into this spiritual kingdom. Bring me into this relationship. That's why she received the spies in peace and with peace. That's why she wasn't right in lying for them. Let's say she was very young in the faith. She had a long way to go. So nobody can approve of her lying for them. God would have given her another way if she'd known, if she'd asked. But nevertheless, neither do we condemn her because even those lies for those spies indicates that she was starting to think in the right direction. She was putting for first the things of God and the purposes of God. She couldn't bear the thought that God's men would be destroyed. So while she was wrong to lie for them, it does show her underlying development and her faith and her trust for the true and living God. So she gave them protection and then she did something else or they did for her because a little later on you read this here from verse 12. Now therefore I pray you, she says to the two men, swear unto me by the Lord. She believes that these young men are godly men and if they make an oath by the name of their God, she can utterly trust them. They're not like Jerichoites. Swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house. And she asks for her entire household, 
because they didn't all live in her house, her family, her connections, to be saved alive when Jericho fell. And the men answered her, verse 14, our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by what our King James Version calls a cord, a rope, obviously. She let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And then she gave them advice as to where to go and how long to hide before the searchers would give up the search. And they promised that they'd undertake their oath. Well, Jericho did fall. And the time did come. It's recorded in Joshua chapter 6 of how it was that uh, Joshua, who was informed personally of this arrangement, instructed that Rahab and her household would be saved. The arrangement would be, this is what she'd agreed with the spies, that she would use a scarlet rope hung out of her window. Now there's debate as to whether this was hung out of the window on the outside of the wall or a window on the inside of the wall. That's not necessary for us to go into this evening, but when Jericho fell, that cord, that line would be seen in what remained of the buildings and the two spies would personally rescue her and her family. If they stepped outside the building, before time, and the cord was not showing, they'd be lost. A scarlet cord. Well, I know that the color would be chosen simply because it's loud and distinctive and easily spotted. Perhaps it was quite unusual to have as any kind of signal in those days but it was chosen for practical purposes. But you know, the old preachers used to make much of this scarlet cord, and it's quite legitimate to do so. In this sense, if Rahab had swerved from that arrangement and put out a white rope, she would never have been safe, or her household, or a blue rope, or not a rope at all, but a scarlet sheet tied to another sheet. Perhaps if she thought this will be more prominent than what I've arranged to do, she would have lost her life and her family would not have been saved. The arrangement could not be kept. She had to use a scarlet rope. That was the arrangement. That alone would save her. Well, this does actually point to a very serious aspect of being saved and knowing the blessing of God. If you wish to be saved, put it from a human direction for a moment, and if you seek the forgiveness of God and a new life and a new nature and eternal life, come the way he has prescribed. Don't change it. Don't alter it. Don't say, I'll put out a different color rope. I don't see it's necessary to follow God's way exactly. What's God's way? Put your trust wholly in the shed blood of Christ in his suffering and death on Calvary when he took away the pain and the punishment of sin for all who would be forgiven. Trust in that alone. Now, you might change it. You might say, all right, I will trust in that to some extent, but I will also trust in some goodness of my own. I think I've got a, a nice nature. I think I, I have sin, but I am quite good in some respects, and I deserve God's blessing. So I will trust 
partially in the atoning death of Christ to take away my punishment and partially in my own good nature and imagined righteousness. You've changed the terms. You can't be heard. You haven't put out a red rope. You put out a white rope or a multicolored rope or something quite different. It won't be seen. It won't be recognized. You're not the household of Rahab. You're not under the agreement, the arrangement. And you perish. How foolish. If you alter it, you've really got to be in a position before God where you say, there is no good in me at all sufficient to deserve the favor of Almighty God. I have sinned too much. My nature is too corrupt. I am too bad. I need 100% the atonement of Christ, suffering and dying for me, paying the price for me, offering up his own perfect righteousness to deserve heaven for me. I depend wholly on Christ the Lord. Don't change the formula. Don't change the terms. That'll be a disaster. Some people change the terms in another way. They say, well, I will trust fully in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, but I have no desire to give my life wholly over to God. I think that if I say to God, I depend entirely upon free forgiveness for salvation, but I'm going to keep my love of things in this world, and I'm going to keep hold of certain sins which I don't consider matter, and I'm going to continue to have my own way. I didn't like it when the preacher said, I must trust in Christ, repent of my sin, and yield over my life to his government and authority. I didn't like that part, so I won't do that. You've not put out a scarlet rope. You've changed the terms. You've put out something else. It, prayer can't be heard. The prayer can't be recognized. The scarlet rope, you must put out exactly according to the arrangement. And God's scarlet rope for us is this. Believe wholly in Christ that you need him entirely. Repent sincerely of all your sin. Yield your life to him so that you'll be his and you'll love him and you'll serve him and you'll cleave to him. That's a genuine prayer. It's a scarlet rope, dear friends. It's fervent. It'll be obvious. Come to the Lord when you pray, not half-heartedly, but very sincerely, very earnestly. Mean it with your whole heart and remember it's trust in Christ altogether. Repent of sin. Give him your life. Be in his hands. Trust in him. Then he'll change you. Then he'll save you. You can see it working in the life of Rahab. You see how she reasons? I believe this place is going to fall. And your life is going to fall one day. You'll breathe your last breath and you'll stand before God in judgment. This world is going to fall one day according to God's timetable. I can't tell you when. Only God knows. She knew Jericho was going to fall. She wanted eternal life and the forgiveness of God for all her prostitution and all her other sins. She wanted to walk with God, a God who is alive, who relates to her. Security, that was secondary. She didn't look round her house on the wall. I can't part with you. This is so beautiful for me. This is so lovely. I've earned this the hard way. Now I've secured it. I'm not giving this up for 
anything and the pleasures and the amusements I have in Jericho. She weighed things with the eye of faith. All this is nothing by comparison to knowing the Lord and having eternal life and the forgiveness of sin. That is how faith reasons. It looks at eternal things, invisible things, divine things. And that's what we must do, dear friends. Rahab found God. She found him truly. He changed her outlook. He changed her heart. He changed her relationship with himself so that she knew him and walked with him. And that can happen to you this evening. If God works in your heart and you bow the knee to him and with great sincerity you repent and yield to him, your life will be altogether different. Let's pray, dear friends. Oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, look upon us, help us, illuminate us, help us to see these things. Oh Lord, come by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit and work in our hearts. Oh, that people may not be lost and live this life with its few pleasures and its many disappointments and heartaches and it's growing old and ending life's journey with no saviour, no eternity of bliss, no proving of God or walking with him. Oh Lord, work within us and change our outlook and draw us to thyself, we ask, in the name of our dear saviour and for his sake, amen. Let's sing together the hymn 374. Hymn number 374. Approach my soul, the mercy seat. <laughs> 